This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Simon Pierce, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 444 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Owen Edgerton. He's the author of the novels The Book of Harold and Everyone Says That at the End of the World, the short story collection How Best to Avoid Dying, and the creative writing guide This Word Now, which he wrote with his wife Jody Edgerton. He's also written and directed the horror movies Follow, Mercy Black, and Bloodfest. And we'll be speaking with him today about his most recent novel, Hollow, about a religious studies professor who becomes obsessed with the hollow earth theory. And now here's our interview with Owen Edgerton. All right, so we're here with Owen Edgerton. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay, so I was just listening to an interview you did with C. Robert Cargill back in 2016, and you guys were talking about how Austin in the early 2000s was a great place for geeks. So could you tell us about that? Yeah, um, it really was a great place for geeks. Cargill likes to talk about that, and I I think he he has a good eye. He has a good eye for um, movements, you know, uh, literary or cultural sort of movements where different thinkers kind of accidentally cross paths. And uh, Austin in the um, in the early 2000s, you had a bunch of cool things going on. Uh, Tim and Carrie Lee had started the Alamo Draft House, uh, where I was doing comedy shows, and uh, and a lot of us film nerds were sort of staying late hours. we were watching weird movies. Uh, comic book stores are kind of popping up. There was a wild sort of poetry slam movement. People were doing kind of Im- improv comedy. That's where I was doing that too. I met my wife doing that and. People were just making stuff up all the time. And we were kind of this mid-sized city. We weren't, no one was there doing art to make it big. If you wanted to make it big, you were going to the West Coast or the East Coast. Here, you were doing it, just make it weird. And uh, and we all kind of influenced each other. And it's fun to see how so many of the folks from that time are still doing stuff today and have been influenced from, from that period. Yeah, and it did, it did sound like the Alamo Draft House was really sort of a, a central hub of all of that. And do you think that you wouldn't have met a lot of the people that you met if there had been no Alamo Draft House? Oh, man, I was so lucky for the Alamo Draft House. I mean, you know, at that point in my life, by choice, <laughs> I was uh, I was living in a, in a van. I, uh, I basically had one job out of college, and I realized I wanted to finish my first novel. So I thought if I could work less hours, then I could write more. And I was thinking most of my income goes towards rent. So I moved out of my apartment, I quit my job, and I moved into this VW camper, you know, with a pop top. And Austin was a perfect home for me. I mean, I would drive around to different parts of the country, but Austin was mainly where I was because I could swim in Barton Springs, which is this beautiful natural springs, and they have showers there too. And <laughs> I'd go to coffee shops, which we have just a slew of them, and I would, you know, abuse the free refills rule all day long. And then at night, I'd do weird gigs, usually comedy gigs, to kind of pay for my coffee and gas. Um, and the Alamo ended up being this comedy gig that I got, and um, it was great. It introduced me to a community of like-minded uh, uh, nitwits, and, and also was really that was really my film school. I would stay and watch these bizarre movies, some of them you know, classics of cinema, and others – drive-in movie that um, you know Tim League had purchased. There was a, a period where Tim League basically heard about this drive-in that was going out of business, and he just bought all their movies. And he didn't know what they were. And he, he drove up, I think, to Oklahoma, drove back, breaking the pickup truck that he had loaded all these prints into. And basically, he said, listen, once a week, people can come in for free, and we're because I don't know what these movies are, because they're not labeled, and we're just going to watch them. And and we'll figure it out as we go along. And that became the beginnings of Weird Wednesday for the Alamo Draft House. Uh, and so, yeah, I met a lot of different people making music and making comedy and making films in, in that uh, in that community. 
So who would you say um, were some of the people that you met who you've ended up collaborating with the most, you know, in the early 2000s there? Well, let's see. I mean, when, when I started, I was doing a show there called uh, Mr. Sinus Theater 3000, creative name. Uh, we were basically a, an homage to Mystery Science Theater. Uh, and I was doing that with Jerem Pollitt and, uh, and John Erler. And Jerem Pollitt and I had met doing uh, comedy. We met doing improv. And then we started doing music together. Jerem's a rock and roller. And he and I would do these uh, music shows. Uh, I think the most lo the longest one was uh, uh, a TGI Th. Thank God it's Thursday because we could get a stage <laughs> on a Thursday. And we would just, we would just do songs together. Uh, and it was a blast. And and Jerem and I ended up doing a bunch of different stuff. And then uh, John joined us. And, you know, Jerem, John and I were making movies in that role for years. And then that group, the three of us split up. And John has continued doing shows. Uh, and I joined him every so often under the name Master Pancake Theater. Um, and so Jer Jerem I did a bunch of stuff with. But it wasn't just that. It was like these... Austin, at this point, these there was just so many people doing so many different things, and they kept overlapping. They kept helping their friends out. So, for example, Germ played in a part in a sort of mockumentary film that was being made by some other friends that we had. And some of those friends ended up doing more in the film world. And so when I started writing scripts with another friend, we took it to one of these friends, Chris Moss, uh, who had been making these improv films in, in a just a, another circle in Austin at that time and said, you know, do you want to join us? So Russell Sharman and myself and Chris Moss became writing partners, which lasted for six plus years, um, ended up writing with them for Disney and for Fox and uh, all over the place. And, you know, some of my closest friends. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I mean, it's funny because, you know, I actually lived in Austin in 2000. And oh, yeah. um, my friends, I was only there for a year. My, I, was, I was just just out of college and my friends moved away and um, I didn't have a job. So I, I just moved back to New York and just listening to you and Cargill talk. I was like, oh, man, I was right there. I could have uh, could have been part of that scene if I had known about it. Well, you know, who knew? Right. I mean, like I I wouldn't have never I didn't. It was it's fun to hear Cargill talk about it as a scene. I, we were just doing our stuff. Um, and it was just like that was that's just what you did on the weekends and uh, during the days. You you just did creative stuff. And Austin was a cheaper town at that point. Um, I mean, I was thinking about other people that I collaborated with, like Jody Sh Sh Sherman, who became my wife. <laughs> we collaborated a lot. And the guy, Les <laughs> McGee, Les McGee was kind of my, my comedy mentor. Um, and we were just all kind of doing stuff and helping each other do stuff. Um, and that was a blast. That was, it, was, it's, it was good to be young. Yeah, and 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 obviously, I mean, people people can probably tell you were just involved with a ton of stuff, and it just um, it's hard for me to even hold it all in my head. And as I was doing research for just yesterday, doing research for this interview, I kept coming across entirely new things. Like, wait, he does that too. He does that too. Like, new things just kept popping up the more uh, you know, more I looked into it. Yeah, I don't sit still very well, <laughs> or or maybe <laughs> I was talking to my manager about just that today, and. And he was like, yeah, gosh, you got these four different careers, you know, novel writing and, and film writing and film directing and, and comedy. And I was like, yeah, if only one of them would pay a full paycheck, <laughs> I, could, I could probably just stick to one of them. But, but I jump around. Yeah. Well, so let's, uh, let's start with the novel writing. So um, kind of how did you sort of what role was writing prose fiction playing in your kind of early career there? Uh, it, it was pretty essential to me. I, I uh, uh, you know, there's sort of the, the uh, role of occupation and this role of vocation. Um, occupation being the job that you do for money and vocation being the job that you feel somehow called to do. Um, that that's kind of the sole work. And for me, uh, novel writing was, was that from a very pretty young age. I just couldn't imagine anything more exciting to do. Uh, and so uh, I was writing stories and and early attempts at novels in pretty early age um i was lucky enough actually uh to also go to a, a grad school program when i was around 30 at uh, texas state in san marcos and uh and that was great too another sort of great community of like-minded book nerds uh and so, yeah, novel writing was always very, very exciting for me. And comedy was often this great outlet that was paying the bills. Um, uh, novel writing has never quite paid the bills, but it's still something I, I think I, I need as part of, uh, I don't know, part of 
uh, it's probably the closest thing I have to a religious practice uh, in my life right now is uh, is getting lost in a novel. So the the uh, MFA program that was uh, around two thousand five, right? Yeah, that's it. Was it end? I ended at two thousand five. That's right. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I basically a couple of days before my daughter was born. <laughs> Had you been publishing stuff prior to that? Uh, yes. Publishing fiction. Publishing some short fiction here and there, and I, I did a little bit before and a little bit after. And then my first novel, I wrote a novel called that not many people have read, called Marshall Hollinger is Driving, and I, I actually self-published that in I think nineteen ninety nine or two thousand. Um, so that, that was sort of my, my first publishing book experience, which actually got optioned by a very small, uh, cool little film company. And so I started thinking even then about like, oh, what does it mean to write a screenplay? And I should look into what that looks like. Mm -hmm. But so, so you were publishing stuff and you still felt like an MFA would, uh, would be a good thing to pursue. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I could tell that I had a lot to learn and, um, and there's something great, uh, yeah. You know, you don't need an MFA. <laughs> uh, no one, no one needs a, an MFA. No one needs a degree or license to create or anything like that. For me, I felt really lucky because um, I did have a, a, a community of, of writers, both the, my fellow students and also my professors, um, that have been really good to me and, and encouraged me and introduced me into different voices and different styles and were some of my best readers and also my best competition. You know, there's something when you're, you're realizing like, oh, okay, here I am. I mean, in my year, I think there was 14 of us. And I was realizing like, well, I better write as exciting and beautifully and as well-crafted as these folks, because we're all going to be sending off to publishers. And my gosh, they're doing brilliant stuff. So I better up my game. Um, and they, they were a brilliant source of inspiration in that way. Yeah, it was it was fun for me to see that you did the MFA at Texas State because actually my girlfriend's doing that right now. That's we we just moved oh. to Austin last year um, for her to do oh, that. Oh, great! Yeah. So um, so she's actually in a, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and she's in a um a TV writing class with Doug Dorst right now. Who I saw. I love Doug Dorst. Yeah, I did. yeah. Doug Doug is a, such a talented writer and, and just such a, a beautiful person. Uh, yeah, I I I I know he's teaching that class and I, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. <laughs> I would love to be taking it. Do you have any like memories that stand out from uh, from the MFA program? Oh yeah, plenty. Uh, I mean, some of them are the silly ones of how fun it was, to, you know, to be, gosh, you know, thirty years old in a smoke laden pub in the middle of San Marcos, a little drunk on cheap beer, and just arguing who was better, Hemingway or Faulkner, and I mean, almost getting into a fist fight over it, like. That kind of book nerdum was was pretty fun, um, but also there was just like some great experiences of um, of reading um, these other writers. I mean, I, I think of some of my favorite writers now, like Stacy Swan, who's got a new book that's going to be coming out soon, and reading her early stuff and being just so blown away. Or Aaron Pringle, whose uh, book Hazada, I Miss You, just came out la this last year in 2020, and and uh, is an incredible novel. Um, and just reading these folks. And uh, and being so impressed uh, by by the stories and their craft and their ability to make words into something beautiful. Yeah, that's really cool. So then, what after the after you finished at Texas State, kind of what happened with your um, novel writing career after that? Yeah, well, I mean, at the same time I was doing Texas State, I was also doing a hell of a lot of comedy shows. Uh, so it was a really tiring time too. Hmm. <laughs> I was getting pretty exhausted and. Uh, and and uh, was was getting married, had child, had my first child right at the end of that program, and and basically a bunch of different things started changing. My first novel, I mean, my first book, book a, uh, a collection of short stories, was published shortly after that. And basically, it was that transition during that time when uh, the Sinus Show that I was doing with Jerem Pollitt and John Erler was was breaking up and John was starting Master Pancake and Jerem was doing some other things. And I was a little bit lost. I was a little bit unsure of what I was going to be doing. And that's when my friend Russell Sharman, who had been a friend of mine for years and years, uh, and we'd always read each other's stuff. I'd read his plays or his screenplays. He would read my novels and my short stories. And he had this one really funny script. And he said, I think it can be funnier, but comedy is not my forte. But you're really funny, Owen. Let's work on it together. 
And so we started working on that. And that's the same one that we went to our friend Chris Moss, who had made this movie Chalk with his buddy Mike Akel that had gotten national attention and earned him an agent and a manager. And Chris became our third. And, uh, and that's how we three started working together, um, which was really great, not just for the experience of you know, writing in Hollywood, which has its ups and downs and all kinds of weird experiences, but uh, being able to, I mean, just even being able to drive around LA with those two guys uh, and laugh between meetings, um, uh, some of the f finest memories of my life. So, uh, so yeah, so, so you, you, the three of you are working on movies together. I'm just looking at your sort of IMDb page and like Freebirds 2013. Is that, that's one of the early ones, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it was actually, I think it was actually kind of one of the late ones, funny enough. We, we were, um, we were writing together and it, it's an interesting business. I mean, the first, basically the first uh, script that we kind of wrote together, we sort of worked on this one that was Russell's uh, script and worked it and it, it got some attention. It got optioned at different places, never got made. Um, but we had really fun adventures with it. Then the next one we wrote got into the blacklist um, which wowed us. And then Warner Brothers purchased it. And we're like, oh my goodness. And then after that, we started doing a lot of, you know, these rewrites and being hired by companies to do polish up jobs. And, uh, and that was really fun in itself as well. Of all that time, I think the one that Warner Brothers purchased is I think meant to be made this year. I think they're talking about it. And that's going back 10 years since Warner Brothers uh, bought that script. And and then Freebirds was another one that we worked on. We were bought on as they were animating it. And we we worked on it, you know, doing rewrite for structure and rewrite for comedy on it. Um, and then sort of basically as that was happening, we were doing all this work and it was fun. And, and we were luckily we were uh, getting paid occasionally, too. Um, <laughs> But I was realizing more and more that I, uh, I love horror, uh, and I, I I wanted to be writing the kind of movies that I love to watch, um, and 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 although I you know I, I love a good animated movie and I, I love a good comedy and everything, I, I more and more wanted to move in that direction. So the three of us again sort of started moving in different directions, and Russell started writing more of his dramas, which he's very talented at. Uh, Chris actually ended up doing a lot of cool stuff. Uh, in reality television and is still doing stuff in that world. And um, I moved towards horror. So I took a couple of my short stories and I wrote a script intentionally uh, cheap. <laughs> like, <laughs> like something something that I was like, let me make it so it's so cheap that someone would take a risk on me directing. Uh, that And that ended up being follow. Yeah, and so then you directed that too. I did. That That was my intention. Basically... I wrote this script based on a couple of my short stories. I I was still writing novels at that time, so I had a a novel come out called The Book of Harold, The Illegitimate Son of God, and um and then then another one of Everyone Says That at the End of the World, and uh and then I was working on this screenplay for Follow, and I I hooked up with this producer that I knew named Seth Kaplan, and I explained I was like I I want to direct this, and Seth is a really brilliant indie producer he's made a bunch of different stuff and that's one of the things i th find so fascinating about him is he has the ability to get things made which is an incredible gift in los angeles so many things do not get made and even working in the studio system um for all those years with uh, russell and chris we found out that so many projects um never made it to the screen and and that was that was painful so uh Seth and I started working and Seth was the one who said, why don't you make a short so that people know you can direct? Because you've been directing, you know, little internet uh, skits and stuff like that, but maybe direct something that could get into a film festival. So I made a short uh, uh, called Follow and I entered it into South By and it was luckily enough got in and that helped, helped sort of convince people that, all right, we'll, we'll let Owen direct this one. <laughs> Yeah, I heard an interview where you um, you talked about meeting Jason Blum, the the big horror um, producer, yeah. and and you you had this follow movie that you could show him to prove yes. that you were able to direct more movies. Yeah, I mean that was goodness gracious, David. That was such a crazy day. So while I mean I love Blumhouse and I, I've loved Blumhouse from way back, just sort of always been impressed 
with how they lean into horror and never apologize for horror. <laughs> you know, they're never like, no, it's not really horror. Yeah, yeah. It's just scary drama. <laughs> um, Ghost house and, movies. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and I just love them, uh, including Cargill's movie Sinister, which is just one of my favorite films. And, um, uh, and so while follow was sort of trying to scrape enough change together to make it and 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 going through all the difficulties of any film but uh, particularly you know a small budget film uh, i was frustrated and I, I wrote the script called the boy and it did the rounds in hollywood and it it made it onto the blacklist and the blood list and it ended up at blumhouse and basically i got a phone call one day and i knew that blumhouse had been looking at the scripts and um i got a phone call from one day and it was jason blum and Jason Blum was like, "Yes, we we want to we want to purchase the script." And I said, "Well, that's great. There's only there's only one thing. There's another group that's kind of interested in it, and they were going to let me direct." And he's like, "Oh, you want to direct, huh?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, well, "Have you ever done it?" I'm like, "Well, yeah. My my first film just played at Fantastic Fest like a week ago." And he's like, "Send me a link. I'll watch it during lunch." <laughs> uh, so I did, and I I got to tell you, that was a <laughs> It was not an easy day for me. I was, I was like, "What is happening?" Jason Blum's watching my film, uh, <laughs> and then he called me back later that day and said, uh, "I said, well, you know, we'll make you a deal. This, so we we can find a way for you to direct this. Let's let's do it." Yeah, and so 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 I watched two of the movies that you've uh, written and directed: Bloodfest and Mercy Black. And so I wanted to ask. Oh, and you also you play in um, Bloodfest. You play this sort of deranged um, horror carnival director or something. Yeah, that's um, a good way of putting it. Yeah. And you, uh, this is a quote from your character. He says, horror is dead. I mean, look around you. Our vampires glitter. Our zombies have become soap opera stars. Our slashers have grown dull and old. We put Freddy on a lunchbox. We put Lovecraft in a coloring book. We have overconsumed and overproduced. And we have taken what was forbidden, what was dangerous, and we've made it common. I was just curious if you, uh, does that express any of your personal feelings at all? Mm, no. I mean, <laughs> it's, I, I definitely with that character, I was there. I think there's an argument to be made that that it can be a concern. Uh, I don't really think horror is doing that. But I think when I think often when the bigger studios get very excited about horror, when they see what a, a low budget film can do that sort of breaks the rules and frightens people by giving them something outside of the lines, all too often, a studio sort of swarms in and says, let's take that and we're going to clean it up and we're going to polish all the, the rough edges and we're going to give people something much safer and much more commercialized. And, and, and you find that happens again and again um, with different franchises and different uh, horror intellectual properties. But overall, I think horror is in a great place. Horror is far from dead. It's you know, it's alive and kicking. It's kicking <laughs> ass. Um, it's it, yeah. I I think this is a great time, and not just for, um, the, you know, not just. I, mean, I don't just mean that it's raking in the money. I mean there's like more voices, more diverse points of view, uh, coming into these stories, which is just making the buffet all the more delicious. Yeah. I mean, Bloodfest, I saw, was sort of um, produced by um, Rooster Teeth, which I know is another Austin area thing. Is that another opportunity that came out of your kind of Austin community? A little bit. You know, it's funny enough that, that those guys were definitely part of that same early 2000s scene, uh, that they were doing their own weird thing. You know, they were making these funny videos. They were making internet videos before there was a thing called internet videos, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and that was super exciting. So we, we kind of grew up around the same time. Um, and then I have a, I mean, I knew those guys and they knew me and, um, we, you know, we'd sort of seen each other's work and, and, you know, John Erler had been in a lot of their, uh, really funny sketches and does a lot of great stuff for them and is one of the voices on red versus blue and i knew other folks who were doing that i got his hand it though a lot of it came down to uh ryan hall and ryan hall was someone that they hired he's now head of studio rooster teeth they brought him in but he had mainly been out in la and he'd been working with these big old companies you know working on the last pirates of the caribbean and everything like that but he was more and more excited about this opportunity to get down and dirty and make things. And Rooster Teeth are always making things. They're always making podcasts and shows and films and uh, all kinds of things. And so he got really excited and he had read uh, 
some of my work when he was back in LA before he had joined forces with Rooster Teeth. And, and so once he was on board, he called me in and said, let's talk about what we can do. And, and I, I called up Seth Kaplan, same guy I made follow with. And I said, let's, what, what would be smart? <laughs> and we had this idea of, of blood fest. And so we talk, took it to Ryan and we started building it from there. So how did it happen that you ended up playing the villain in the movie? <laughs> well, um, uh, when, when when we were sort of, I, you know, I've been pitching the show a number of times, both with Ryan and Seth, and we would tell different, you know, different meetings would go, and I'd say, here's the, the, the whole world, this could be a series, this could be a movie, what do you think? And I think for Ryan and Seth, they kept hearing my voice every time I would talk about this character, um, <laughs> <laughs> this Anthony Walsh. Uh, ringmaster, and uh, and then as we were filming, uh, we were we we filmed we were still casting as we were filming, so we still had sort of offers and thinking about who would be the best to play this role. But part of me, I was thinking, I was like, I I know what I'm able to do, uh, you know, I, I I've got a gauge at least at least of like, my my acting range, I think, and so I was thinking like, I, I really only want to be able to cast someone if they're going to do a, a better job than I think I can do. Uh, a bigger name, a better face, a more iconic image. And uh, and as we were sort of casting, it's just sort of like as we were sort of who was available and, and who was ready to do it, who was really responding to the script. Um, it came down to like, well, no, I, I think it's going to be me. Uh, and that was super fun. <laughs> I, I, know, I, I had a blast playing that character. Maybe, maybe a little too much fun. <laughs> Well, I think it's interesting, you know, you have all these uh, these different film projects and stuff going on. And you still find time to write novels. I mean, so I, I, I read your novel, Hollow, that I want to talk to you about. But sort of like, what was that like balancing those two different career tracks? Gosh, you know, it's it's really weird, uh, David. And it's it's interesting that you ask, because I've, I've been thinking about that this week. Um, I'm just sort of trying to balance those two. Um, you know, if you've read Hollow, you know that Hollow... <laughs> Hollow and Bloodfest are really different <laughs> projects. Uh, you know, Hollow is, is sort of a, a meditation on grief and maybe the book of Job. <laughs> and Bloodfest is, is a gory comedy horror. Um, I, I, you know, I, like I said before, I think there's just sort of a, a, a part of me that needs to kind of go mad in the pages. And, um, and I, I think I find that when I'm writing prose, uh, definitely when writing Hollow, um, there were there were times where I just like allow myself just to sort of disappear into a friend's cabin for a few days and just sort of like I maybe just sort of bleed my worst nightmares onto the page. And I don't mean nightmares like what's the scary thing in the shadows, but nightmares like what if something happens to the people I love most? Uh, what if I'm not able to protect my children? Um, what does that say about the nature of God or the nature of the universe or the nature of existence? Um, it, it was an interesting time. I was actually uh, location scouting for Bloodfest when I got the galleys for Hollow. And I, it was a bit surreal to be sort of having both these experiences at the same time. I was filming Mercy Black when Hollow got onto the NPR Best Books of the Year list. And uh, it all just became kind of a weird haze. <laughs> <laughs> like all these different images and ideas that had sort of been brewing in me in one way or another um, for years, uh, you know, in my laptop and files uh, and ideas were now sort of out in the world or being put onto camera. And, uh, and that's a little unnerving and uh, thrilling and, and terrifying all in one gulp. When you talk about sort of going off on retreats to to work on the novel, I heard you say you went to some place called the Writer's Barn, and yeah. I looked it up, and it, it's like a place you can writers can go to sort of get away from it all. Or yes, I mean they actually do a lot of different stuff. The Writer's Barn here in in South Austin, and um, they they host classes and they host writers retreats for just like one writer, or maybe a group of writers in a led retreat, and uh, it's a beautiful space. And basically, I just sort of, I said, can I, I, I think I still owe them a class. I think what I was <laughs> going to do is like, I, I was going to use their space for a few days 
and then teach a class for them because I couldn't necessarily afford the space. So <laughs> I think I still owe them that. Uh, but that was great. That's that's actually where I finished my first draft of of Hollow, and it it was just like that space where I could go a little crazy. I I when I do those retreats, I basically I pack some protein drinks, um, some Nescafe instant coffee, some Nescafe instant decaf coffee, <laughs> and and that's about it. And then I I uh, I kind of stay up all night and I do weird sleeping things and I talk to myself and I yell and I wander around and I I type. Yeah, so so hollow um, for people for listeners, it's about a um, a, a former um, professor of religious studies and he's suffered a, a great personal tragedy and his life is kind of unraveled, and he meets a guy who um, introduces him to this concept that of the hollow earth that there's a you know some sort of super advanced race living inside the earth that they could potentially contact. And he sort of, um, and it sort of goes from there. But I, I heard you say that you yourself actually got really fascinated with this hollow earth idea. I did. I did, uh, I, I did. M much to the chagrin of my family. Um, I, I end up sort of uh, uh, going down rabbit holes and, and uh, sort of embracing obsession a little bit when I'm working on different projects. And, uh, and, you know, hollow, you can see, I think I, I can see with hindsight is the intersection of two obsessions, one being the book of Job and the other being hollow earth theory. Uh, who knew, who knew that <laughs> those two <laughs> intersected, but I think they, they were meant to be, they were, that would be uh, so awkward if, it, if there were two hollow earth plus Job books that came out at the same time, like that's <laughs> really uncomfortable. That would that would have been a surprise. <laughs> that would that would have been amazing. Um, but yeah, the uh, the the hollow earth theory, I, I I still find really really fascinating and 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 fun. And it's sort of been it's been in history for a long time. It, it, you know, there was a time when Congress was looking to finance an expedition into the hollow earth, into these holes that are meant to exist in the North and South Pole, like. And so before we reached the North Pole, before um, that was sort of mapped out, a lot of people sort of believed anything could be up there. It's, it was just as likely that there's holes into the Earth up there, um, which is, of course, now it's, it's ludicrous. And what's interesting, too, is how many people still believe it, um, that it becomes um, uh, a sort of statement of faith. And when you believe things on faith, then somehow even arguments against it end up being for it. Uh, I think you'll you'll find it in a similar way with what's happening right now as Donald Trump uh, keeps proclaiming that he won an election that he lost. And you have these people who have made a statement of faith of, I'm going to believe this. And no matter the evidence that comes my way, I am going to believe it. And I think by nature, we are people who we feel good when we make statements of faith. It feels nice, um, even if the object of that faith is not worthy of it. Um, and uh, I think that, that happens with conspiracy theories and uh, flat earth theories and hollow earth theories uh, and uh, presidential uh, li or lies from the person holding the role of president. Um, it's an interesting thing. It, when I was writing about Hollow Earth, I, I was celebrating uh, people's ability to believe what is obviously not true. Um, I, I thought, I, I still think that's a real powerful uh, part of humanity, that we can believe things that we know are not true or believe things that are obviously not true. Um, even to the point where we're crying a movie for a character, we're like, oh, I'm hurting for that character. When we know that character's fine, it's just Meryl Streep. And she's okay, but we 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 allow ourselves to believe it. Um, but as the book came to be, it it came to be, uh, and and Donald Trump was elected. I found more and more that those conspiracy theories uh, weren't so cute. Uh, that that power could move in a bunch of different ways and and a dangerous way. Uh, and uh, that still seems to me be, be the case. In the book, there's a there's an organization called the uh, Hollow Earth Society of Central Texas. I assume that's that's fictional, or or is there something like that? It, it's it's fictional, but there are Hollow Earth uh, organizations. And in the book, of course, I talk about a uh, an expedition being planned to the hole at the top of the world 
uh, that with in an Russian Russian icebreaker. That was a real thing. Uh, I try to get on board. Uh, they ended up not going, but I I try to join them. Well, did they accept you? Or like mm, what they have? They, I, they didn't call back. So <laughs> I, I kind of filled out some paperwork and I left a couple of uh, messages, but I think they they were a little worried. So no, they they didn't they didn't accept me. I thought being a writer, you know, I thought this would be cool, but no. <laughs> did 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 they know you were a skeptic, like a hollow earth skeptic? Uh, I'm trying to remember how honest I was about my skepticism. I I think I probably was, but I was so enthusiastic. I thought that. I, th I thought they'd invite me along. Uh, <laughs> and I got permission. I got permission from my wife. She said, like, if you get accepted, you can go. You know, but. Was this while you were working on the novel? Yes, it was while I was working on So it would have been novel. research, basically. Exactly. Exactly. But it, but it's never, ha it, it fell apart. It's, they're not, they're not going to do it anymore. So far, I haven't checked recently. It sort of kind of went in and out of being able to happen and. It's net, then it was funded and then it was going to have to be funded by people sending money in and it's kind of going up and down. So I'll have to check. But at some point, who knows, we might not be hearing from them for a couple of years and then boom, they'll come out the South Pole and it will <laughs> change. Yeah. Um, did you ever, did you interact really with anyone who believes in the hollow earth? Um, yeah. Interestingly, you know, I, I did a lot of different reading uh, and watching of videos and I think a little chatting online with folks who believe the hollow earth theory, but not much in person. But once the book came out, I did almost every book event I did for hollow. There'd be one or two people and they'd kind of be at the back of the room and they'd be really excited that I had written this book. And um, I think really disappointed when <laughs> I started saying the earth is not hollow. <laughs> <laughs> so did the i mean did they have did they argue with you like did, yes like, did you think about have you considered xyz or there was a little bit uh, there was there was definitely some arguments and uh, and another point like in history like i was saying uh, i think if it had been six years before i would have been like yeah let's talk about it let's let all the crazy ideas into the room i mean that's how i write of like, I want all the crazy ideas. I want the weird ideas because somewhere inside those crazy, ugly, strange ideas is something brilliant that we otherwise would have turned away because we didn't recognize how beautiful it looked uh, or beautiful it is underneath the strangeness of it. And and I think I would have felt the same way about hollow earth theory. Um, but when I was actually doing the book events, I was like, no, I don't think we need to, I, I don't think we need to value all opinions equally. Uh, that science actually ha has a way to your <laughs> a, a way to your vote <laughs> in this case of like when we're dealing with things whether it's a, a climate change or a pandemic um, or or any number of different things I th I think it's it's it, it is not fair to say everything is every opinion is of an equal basis that's that is maybe not fair is not the word it's not wise nor is it practical uh, to say that every opinion holds equal weight. You know, earlier this year, I interviewed a, a guy named Jonathan Kay. He wrote a book called Among the Truthers about the psychology behind conspiracy theories. Mm. And he was saying that it's actually really hard often to argue with conspiracy theorists that he, you know, he, he when he first got into it, he thought, oh, I'm, you know, I'm really smart. I'm a professional journalist. I, I should, I'll demolish these people. And he actually found that so, so many times a conspiracy theorists they really know the subject matter, you know, and then they have all these really hyper specific argu technical arguments that are complete nonsense. But, you know, unless you have spent as much time obsessed with this as they have, uh, you, you, you know, you have a really hard time um, saying exactly what's wrong with the, the specifics when the, the big picture is, is, is obviously false, you know. Oh, you're so right. I mean, you know, you'd have people saying, saying like, well, listen, if, if there is no hole at the North Pole, why is it that every time a NASA certified satellite goes over that portion of the North Pole, it goes blank and none of those pictures have ever been released? Why is that? And I be like, what? what? <laughs> I don't know. And that's not true. <laughs> There's not NASA satellites don't do that. But but I don't I haven't researched NASA satellites. <laughs> and, and so it is one of those things of like, yeah, it, it, it it is a difficult, it's a difficult conversation. <laughs> in the book, there's a, a section where it says, um, 
In the heart of the hollow earth is a massive mirror or screen on which our enlightened inner world cousins monitor our progress. The lamas describe this device as a, quote, magic mirror and promise that it can reveal the future, show the past, or unveil the most unfathomable of mysteries. Is that something you came up with or is that part of hollow earth lore? It's based on, there, there is some hollow earth lore that goes along with that. I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly where, where there was like, there was this, there were different ideas as a bunch, of course. David, be careful. Be careful what you do, because <laughs> you can you can spend <laughs> this rabbit hole goes all the way to the center of the earth, <laughs> um, and and part of them was this idea, or what what are the ideas? What was this idea of like, oh, there's screens and they're monitoring everything that we're doing. Um, you know, we're we're being sort of controlled by beams and puppetry in in some ways, um, and that was one of the ideas. Uh, but in, in another way, what I was sort of going for there was I have a character who's desperate to find out what the meaning of everything is. He's desperate to understand why his young child died and everything in his life fell apart. Um, and so for him, this is basically like, can I can I peek into the mind of God and, and find out what the fuck was going on? Well, right. You were saying that, you know, half the inspiration was the book of Job. And I mentioned the story is written from the point of view of a former um, professor of religious studies. Is that hard to write a, a story from that point of view, not being a professor of religious studies yourself? You know, that's a great question. I, uh, there's a, I, I actually really enjoy doing that. You know, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for religious studies. Um, I love reading about it. I, I studied religious studies as my minor in college, but, uh, but I think I just like, it's something I, I keep going to. So a lot of that, uh, a lot of that thinking, that style of thinking, I think has just stuck with me and is still in my head. So I, I, I don't mind that. Also, there's this wonderful thing that I've realized more and more. It took a long time for me to realize that, um, I can write characters who are smarter than I am just by writing slower. <laughs> you know, they're, they're saying something in a conversation, but I can take a week to think of what they're saying and look up stuff in between. So it enables me to be, uh, to craft characters that are smarter than I am. So did you really know a lot about the book of Job when you got the idea or did you do the research after getting the idea? I started, I often start my, the ideas I think that I work best for me are start, start with a question, uh, a nagging question. Uh, and for me, this question was, um, what is at the heart of the universe? You know, these horrible things happen. Uh, people suffer and people are lonely and people are, are lost to each other. And also there's such beauty. Uh, you know, there's sunrises and babies and, and both of these exist at the exact same time. And I was trying to understand, well, what does that mean? Like, is there a heart at the center of the universe? Uh, which turns out is the question that the book of Job asks. You know, Job has this character who's suffering completely, loses his children, loses his health, loses all his possessions, and uh, is basically crying out to God saying, I, I didn't do anything. So why is this happening? Um, and I didn't know. I mean, I was so familiar with the book of Job. I dove much deeper in as I was writing this um, and read different translations. Stephen Mitchell's translation really affected me and his essays about it. A lot of different book writings and, and thoughts on it. Um, and just keep going back to that question of uh, what does it mean that the universe is both so painful and so beautiful? Well, I thought it was interesting. The way it's described in the book is that the story of Job was a, a familiar story. You say like uh, Cinderella or something, and it was this sort mm -hmm. of straightforward story about a person who is uh, pun, you know, who sort of suffers all these um, horrible twists of fate and doesn't lose their faith and is rewarded. And that the version of the story that that we read in the Bible, someone has taken that pretty simple story and kind of inserted this much more thoughtful philosophical. A discussion kind of just stuck it in the middle there yeah yeah it's it's pretty fascinating i mean this is not my observation but this you know this is uh from biblical studies and they basically if you look at it you can you, even if you open up uh, your, whatever bible that you find in the hotel wherever you're staying you'll, you'll see that it even changes on the format from prose to the sort of broken lines of poetry uh, right in the middle and then goes back to prose at the end. So it was, it was like a bit of a folk story. Like a guy gets tested by God, but he sticks by God, although everything goes bad and God gives him everything back. Yay. 
um, it feels like a simple story. And then basically a writer or maybe several writers said, let's, let's just break this apart. Let's, let's stay in the really hard part right at the center here uh, and, and be there for a while. Um, like Tom Stoppard taking, you know, two side characters in Hamlet and writing a whole play about them. I'm like, let me take one moment <laughs> here and, and, and stay in the discomfort of that. Um, and that, uh, you know, that's why I think it's such a beautiful, beautiful book, uh, Job, because it asks really difficult questions. Why do horrible things happen to us? What sort of, uh, were there other responses that you got after the book was published that kind of stick out in your mind? Um, yeah, you know, it was interesting. I, of course it was the best were when people were like, thank you. Uh, and, and this was painful and, and, and beautiful to read. Um, I, I, people, I thought, you know, I didn't think of it necessarily as a dark novel, uh, but but people definitely thought it was a dark mo novel. But I, I, I like to think of it that it's sort of looking at the darkness and seeing hope, uh, and it's sort of a path forward. Um, and then I did have some people who, um, you know, old friends, some dear friends who who won't read my novels. Um, some friends who basically knew me, uh, you know, when I was younger, I was a devout Christian. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I, that was a period of my life for a good 10 years or plus where I was just, that was everything to me and friends from, from that point, some of those friends, like they just won't, they don't want to read this kind of novel. They don't, they, that, and that, that's always, uh, that's a bit of a heartbreak, but I understand. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Well, I mean, the book, I mean, it really, I mean, it's a relatively short novel, and it, but it really, it packs an amazing emotional punch in terms of just really putting the protagonist through an emotional ringer. But it's also a really funny book. I mean, there's lots of, you know, lots of the character interactions are just hilarious. Yeah. Thanks, David. You know, it was interesting. I was, you know, like we talked about, like, I've always been doing comedy in one way or another. I mean, I'm doing a comedy show tonight online, and, and uh, it you know, it's, it's maybe it's an addiction, uh, but it's always been a really good friend of mine. And as I was writing this novel, you know, I, I have this one character who showed up and he's, you know, kind of bombastic and uh, and outrageous. And he always takes control of a situation for better, for worse. And he's he's a, a really comic character. And in a lot of ways, I'm like, this character saved this novel. Because, uh, you know, if you're de dealing with, uh, you know, grief and uh, questions of, uh, of the meaning of life and homelessness and poverty and death, it's good to have some laughs in there, too. Uh, and I was really actually really grateful for that character showing up and and in injecting not only um, the humor, but I think when you do inject humor, injecting humanity, um, I think a real dour novel can sometimes lack life uh, because life is, you know, isn't always, even in most dour moments, we find reasons to laugh. Yeah, absolutely. In the um, acknowledgments, you say, um, a continent of gratitude to my excellent editor, Dan uh, Smetanka, for pushing me to take the novel where it wanted to be. Could you say, like, where did, where, where did it want to be? Yeah, you know, Dan did... Dan did. Uh, Dan's a really brilliant editor, and I I'm very lucky to work with him. And I would love to work with him again. Uh, and Dan basically realized um, he realized I was uh, averse to finding an easy answer uh, to to tying everything up in a in a, a knot. But he he basically was urging me first of all to find some kind of hollow earth, to find some opportunity for my character to to uh, to get inside and so i was able to sort of write this whole sequence towards the end that basically gets to that mirror that you're talking about and uh and that was wonderful and challenging and i, I really appreciated him pushing me that way and also he pushed me to sort of find uh an ending and work towards it that gave you know basically he urged me like what is the taste you want to leave in people's mouths when they turn the last page and uh, and, and i knew that i was looking for some kind of hope uh, but but a true hope not not a not a hallmark card hope um and and he helped me sort of work towards that he's very good at sort of pointing there and say do something around there <laughs> 
uh, and I, I, I think he's great. He's a really talented uh, editor. He's one of those editors, uh, when I know he's worked on a book, I'm all the more excited to read it. Yeah, well, I really love that section of the book you're talking about. So I'm glad that he uh, encouraged you to put that in there. And that actually leads into my next question. You know, I mentioned since I moved to Austin recently, I wanted to ask you, um, is Inks Lake State Park, you think, the best place to dispose of a body in Austin? <laughs> Such a good question. Such a good question. Uh, I, I can't legally answer <laughs> that question. <laughs> there's, there's, there's probably some other ones. I I, I, both in my novels and my screenplays, I think a little bit about good ways to dispose of bodies. Uh, and now, frighteningly enough, so do my children. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then, I'm like taking a walk in the woods, and my daughter says, you know, if you are going to bury a body, bury it standing up so there's less space for the body to be discovered near the surface. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and she said that then kill an animal, put it on top of the buried body so that the dog digs it up. They just find a dead deer there, never even thinking there's a corpse just a few feet below. <laughs> Let's get back to the car now. <laughs> do, you, do you watch a lot of horror movies as a family or? Um, no, no, not too much as, as a family. M my my youngest, my uh, my 12 year old uh, digs watching a bit of horror and my 15 year old she's a filmmaker herself and so we'll we'll watch a slew of different movies but usually when it comes to <laughs> you know uh watching an all-out horror movie that's me alone uh by the tv in the middle of the night when you say she's she's 15 and she's a filmmaker like what kind of filmmaking is she doing She's mainly like doing shorts, uh, and actually, she uh, she she goes to Headwater School here in Austin and works with filmmaker Alex Chu, who runs the program there. She's a really wonderful screenwriter, and and they've done such good stuff. Actually, she just to brag on her, like uh, she edited this uh, music video uh, uh, as part of a school project, and it got into South by for 2020. Oh, wow. the, you know, the one that was just a virtual, uh, you know, didn't, yeah, didn't yeah. happen, didn't happen. And, but it was really cool. And it was so exciting for her to sort of get that, that accolade. So often, you know, the, <laughs> a few nights ago, uh, during Thanksgiving break, you know, my wife and I were like asleep and I was like, what, what's going on in the kitchen? It's three in the morning and I'm hearing stuff. And both of the kids are kind of laughing. And in the morning, Arden, Arden shows us the experimental short film they made during the night called Bread. And, and it was brilliant. Well, it must be so nice. I mean, you know, these days, you know, with uh, your phone, you know, there's a camera in your phone and there's YouTube and everything. It just seems like there's so many more opportunities for young filmmakers than there were, you know. So true. Ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, you know, like I. Uh, there's a, a better camera in your pocket than the one I made my first movie with. Yeah, it's it's really true. Uh, and then that means also there's less excuses, like, you know, make some movies right out there. And I, I, I know a lot of us are sort of like, oh, we need permission to make a movie. Come on, someone say OK. And a lot of young filmmakers are like really hoping that someone taps them on the shoulder and says, go ahead. But man, there are opportunities to make movies now like never before. And, and you know, maybe you you've. You, Maybe you don't want to be a cinematographer. You just want to be the writer. But if you've got a script, then you know someone who has a camera who wants to film it. And that camera person, they know someone who wants to direct but doesn't have a camera and doesn't have a script. <laughs> and that director knows some actors who really want a script and be in front of a camera and be directed by a director. I mean, almost any one of us in our circle of friends or uh, and, and community um, have the crew and team to make that film. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really cool. I did want to ask you, you know, again, since I just moved to Austin, like, what are some uh, things that I should check out that um, that would be of interest to fantasy and science fiction fans? Because it seems like you seem to be very well connected uh, in that sort of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, right now, uh, you know, I would say um, stay home <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and keep yourself safe and keep others safe, um, and uh, you know, that that would be a big one. <laughs> uh, and and no, I know, not an easy one, but I think staying home is. Uh, is really important. Um, there's the uh, the Other Worlds Film Festival, um, which is a smaller film festival that's happening right about now, and that does some really cool things. Fantastic Fest uh, happens, of course, once a year, usually in September, and that's brought to us by the Alamo Draft House, and that is just a great collection of films and filmmakers and film lovers all getting together once a year, and that community kind of keeps up. 
uh, all the year round. Um, there's a bunch of cool uh, comic book stores that I sort of stop in, and but I, I couldn't really, I don't really know enough about which are the best or anything like that. I, 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 I wish I, I did, but I can say that like the fantasy section at, Fant uh, I mean, at Book People is pretty great. The graphic novels, they've got a great collection there. And uh, I just love that they give as much attention to mystery thrillers uh, and graphic novels as they do to literary books. And, <laughs> uh, and I, I really appreciate that. So those are some of the things. Yeah. Are you, um, will you be doing uh, Master Pancake Theater or One Page Salon ever again in the future? Yeah. So um, luckily, both of those have found a way to pivot online. Uh, so Master Pancake, we've been doing shows uh, four times, up to four times a week for free on Twitch. And uh, and John has sort of been running those. And we often are showing like older recordings of shows we've done in the past at the old Alamo Draft House, and and showing them now. And then we're we're basically coming on and hosting them. Uh, but we've also been doing new shows, whether it's Cats, <laughs> which we did <laughs> to celebrate Joe Biden's win, or uh, I know that John and a couple of other folks have been doing uh, 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 Walker, uh, Texas Texas Ranger, Walker, yeah. what is it, right? Yeah, yeah. Walker, Texas Ranger, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and Lone Star 911 and, and cool things like that. So we're doing shows quite a bit and then i've also been doing um so i'll be doing one of those actually tonight and um we're also doing i've been doing one page salon i've been doing a lot of one page salons usually in collaboration with the writers league of texas and we've been doing them as fundraisers for different uh, nonprofits or businesses in need and uh, that's been great it's been great to sort of help out those businesses uh help out those nonprofits, and give writers a platform to read and and you know it, I really miss the North Door and doing those shows live like I miss the Alamo, um, but also it's there's something wonderful about being uh, in a room filled with people from all over the country sometimes all over the world for an event, um, uh, and that's that's wonderful as well. So so if I just uh, do a search for Master Pancake Theater and or One Page Salon, it's pretty straightforward to find those online. Yeah, I think so. If you look for One Page Salon, I, we're, we're posting it at a bunch of different places. And Master Pancake Theater is, is uh, Master Pancake Theater, I believe, all one word on Twitch. Yeah, no, that, I didn't actually realize that was going on right now, so that's cool. I'll check that out. Yeah, it's um, super fun. I also mentioned I listened to your interview with uh, C. Robert Cargill. It was uh, a show you did on NPR called um, The Write-Up. I was just wondering if you could talk about that. And, you know... Um, it ran, I think it ran from 2014 to 2017. So like, what was that like? And um, will you ever do anything like that again? I would love to do something like that again. Yeah, that was a great period of time. I was, uh, I basically uh, approached producer uh, Rebecca McEnroy, who's such a smart uh, producer there and on air person there at KUT. And we put together the podcast and it basically me talking to writers about their books and about their careers. And uh, I loved it. Talking to Cargill was great. We did that at South By, at a live recording at South By. Talking to, you know, George Saunders was wonderful. And uh, Dan Schoen, all these great writers that I really respect. And I mean, all honesty, it was a bit selfish. In the same page, way One Page Salon is. I'm like, I get to like hang out with writers and ask them about <laughs> the cool, you know, their cool books. This is great. Um, so that was really wonderful. Um, and interesting enough, Rebecca and I were just talking at the beginning of this year of like, well, what would be a, a new way of doing that? And let's talk about that. And, and then, of course, the world kind of changed in, <laughs> in surprising ways. And, uh, and, and so I think, I think that conversation is still on hold for a bit. Yeah. Well, that's, no, that's really cool, though. And yeah, if, uh, I mean, I've been doing basically that for 10 years. So if, yeah. you know, if you're selfish, I'm super selfish. But uh... <laughs> Um, but we're pretty much out of time. So do you have just any other, uh, any other final thoughts or other projects you want to let people know about? Gosh, you know, that's a, a great question. Um, if I have any uh, other things, I mean, I, I appreciate you sort of, uh, pointing folks to the master pancake and one page salon. Oh, I tell you one thing that's kind of fun that I've been doing a little bit. I mentioned Russell Sharman, one of my old writing partners and one of my closest friends, he and I started a podcast called the horror and basically, as I started writing horror movies, and I would send him early drafts of the scripts and early cuts of the film, and he'd give me notes. But he was constantly like, by the way, I don't like horror. 
I don't get why you do. <laughs> and so finally he said, why don't you assign me a horror movie each week and we'll get on a podcast and talk about it. So we started a podcast called The Horror where I force him to watch horror movies and he tries to convince me they're not good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh, I mean, that would be one thing to look at. But I, I think overall, um, I was going to say, David, I was, I was listening to your interviews and um, uh, of, of different people I love, uh, including Cargill. Uh, and and uh, I, I think you just do such a beautiful job uh, of, of talking to people. Um, it, it's an interesting time. Uh, a friend of mine recently pointed out that if there's any lesson to be come from this year, maybe it's, uh, it's listening. You know, it's it's listening to voices other than our own. Um, that is something I'm trying to do. Um, I'm trying to hear those voices that I I've been talking too loud to hear. Uh, and uh, I I appreciate that you're you're bringing people on and and asking those questions and and making space for voices. Oh no, yeah, thank thank you so much, and thanks for listening. And um, yeah, I think that's a a really beautiful thought about about listening more. I, I can't top that. So uh, we should wrap things up there. Uh, so we've been speaking with Owen Edgerton about his novel, Hollow. So, Owen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I really appreciated it. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Owen Edgerton for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening. 